New York Times, Tesla looks to regain its luster in solar energy by slashing prices. Tesla just reported a $702 million loss in the first quarter as deliveries of cars and solar systems tumbled. The company's stock price is down by more than 27% so far this year, and many analysts believe it will soon need to raise money by selling shares or bonds because its cash holdings dropped by about $1.5 billion in the first three months of the year. The solar industry is known for intense competition and low profit margins in the first three months of the year. Tesla fell to third place behind Sunrun and Vivant Solar and Installations, according to preliminary analysts by Wood McKenzie, a research and consulting firm. This brings us to something we've been wanting to talk about for a very long time. How do you want to start this? Well, should we start with the CNN thing and why I think it's... The most effective way to curb climate change might surprise you? Yeah, okay. I, I was really surprised. Okay, what, I, okay, why were you surprised by this? We're not going to do this on the air. Yeah, we're not going to... It's a little survey thing, a little game, I think. <laughs> you drag and write Electricity use. Oh, wait, ah. No, go back down. Okay. Electricity use. Just pick how to do or something. Okay, nuclear power be one. Yeah. Uh, harness wind energy on land. Uh, capture the power of the waves, maybe. Uh, I'd do that. How'd I do? Nope. You're totally wrong. Wow, I was exactly <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> nuclear power is the best energy. Isn't the, doesn't have the well, best energy density. They're, they're saying, let's harness wind energy. What? Yeah. And then solar. How is nuclear third? I don't know. We... Oh, I think they also talked about going electric with our cars. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't help you either. It doesn't help with emissions. Yeah. When you have coal. Yeah. When we're electricity. currently fossil fuel based. So. Yeah. So University of Chicago, or some guy writing a paper, do renewable portfolio standards deliver lower emissions competitive prices? Let's take a look. It's a little dry. And one popular, perhaps maybe the most uh, popular, and certainly I think most pervasive policy, uh, are something called renewable portfolio standards. And what renewable portfolio standards do uh, is they mandate that a certain fraction of the, of the state's generation come from particular technologies, uh, almost always uh, zero carbon technologies. Uh, and they cover about 64% of electricity generation in the United States. Uh, Despite the pervasiveness, uh, I think one thing that it motivated us uh, in writing this paper uh, was there's not a lot of information on what the costs and the benefits of those policies are. Uh, and part of that is it's not that easy uh, to measure that. Uh, on the cost side, the first cost, it's the direct, which we call the direct cost, is pretty easy to measure. That's uh, the differences in the cost of generating a kilowatt hour of electricity. But uh, a lot of renewables also impose what we call <laughs> indirect costs uh, on the electricity generating system. Uh, and those tend to fall into three buckets. Uh, the first is uh, they're intermittent. Uh, and so when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, there has to be some backup technology so people have electricity. Yep. Uh, the second is they take a lot of space uh, and the resources tend to be away from the people. Uh, and so there can be more expensive uh, transmission costs associated with integrating them. Uh, and then the third is once you force in a new technology, some of the existing technologies are not going to be able to play in the system anymore. And that's either going to fall on owners of capital or on uh, ratepayers. Uh, and so separating all that is very difficult to do. And what we're going to do, and I'll talk more about it, is just say that except for the capital uh, owners of capital part, we, we're going to say all those are going to show up uh, in retail electricity prices. And so that'll be... Our, our main measure of, uh, of the cost. Okay. Do renewable policies deliver? Do they? We'll see. Let's see. Okay. So let me try to speed up. What are renewable portfolio standards? There's 30 states that have them. Here's a map of the U.S. Uh, and including the years. The first state that introduced it uh, was 1991. Uh, was Iowa, uh, Nevada was after in 1997, uh, Melanie's New Mexico, 2004. Uh, what are uh, RPS? Here's some characteristics of Renewable Portfolio Standard Program. Ishan, uh, my terrific co-author, uh, coined this analogy, I thought it was excellent, uh, is that there, no two of them are exactly alike, just like no two snowflakes are exactly alike. Uh, 
but there's a tremendous amount of similarity, just as there is across Snowflake. Uh, and so 100% of them include wind, 100% include... Across all 30 states? All of them include wind, solar, biomass, and landfill gas? Yeah. yeah. Include solar, 100% include biomass, 100% include landfill gas. And so there are some differences across them, but by and large, you should think of them as uh, trying to mandate uh, the use of wind, solar, and a, uh, a couple other uh, technologies. Uh, last thing, uh, the percentage of emissions, uh, greenhouse gas, <coughs> CO2 emissions that are covered by RPS programs is about 19.5%. Uh, and so that's often thought of, and that's uh, you know, total emissions, that's often thought of as evidence uh, that these programs are politically palatable, and they, they do exist in 30 states. By contrast, as part of uh, my new friends on Twitter, uh, where there's a claim that uh, carbon pricing is impossible to do, I just went and checked, well, what fraction of U.S. emissions are covered by carbon pricing? Uh, and it's actually like 9% uh, if you add up Reggie and uh, California. So I just want to make the point, like, it's not that RPS is like there's a glide path. Uh, and that's a policy that we can have anywhere and carbon prices. Really complicated stuff. Yeah. So it's really Okay. Here's three main, three results. main results of the paper. Uh, the first is six years after, uh, seven years after one of these uh, policies goes into law, the net requirement is that about two percentage points new of uh, renewables have to be part of the system. Uh, Twelve years later, it's about 4.2 percentage points. Uh, so... We don't actually very small. have a lot of yeah. evidence so far of states that have engaged in very ambitious renewable portfolio standard programs. Uh, the headline number is often larger, but the net requirement, the new requirement, is often uh, much more modest. Uh, the second result uh, is that seven years after the passage of these programs, uh, the average retail electricity price is up by about 11%. The average electricity goes up? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> 12 years, it's up by, later it's up by about uh, 17%. And you 17 can see percent. that that kind of is marching up uh, as time goes by. Uh, and then the third result uh, is that, and you know, this is not the, I would say that's not the most robust uh, result, uh, <laughs> but the third result is it's the CO2 intensity of electricity generation uh, goes down. Uh, and if you take the estimates literally, uh, they, uh, well, they go down, and this is uh, illustrated here. Let me add it all up now and so that we can get to the conversation uh, with our experts. Uh, if you took all the CO2 that was reduced, uh, that was abated due to RPS programs uh, during the first, their first seven years in force uh, and divided that by the higher electricity prices in those states, uh, if you do it one way, you end up with about $190 per ton. Uh, and if you do it uh, a way that found smaller CO2 reductions, uh, which is today's not the day to dive into those details, <laughs> is about $460 yeah. uh, per ton. Uh, and uh, if you do just look at the seventh year afterwards, it's about $167 uh, and $300 a ton. So the bottom line from this that I take away from this and that our uh, Ishan and Richard and I take away from this uh, is that these policies are effective at reducing carbon, uh, but they have a large impact uh, on electricity prices. And then when <laughs> you add that all you up, don't say. Uh, yeah. these programs are pr reducing CO2 uh, by, uh, at, at, at the rate of a couple hundred dollars uh, per ton. That exceeds conventional estimates of the social cost of carbon. It exceeds uh, the cost per ton uh, that you can get from cap and trade markets, uh, and uh, I think it, it suggests that these can be expensive ways uh, to get reductions. Now, I want to underscore and emphasize expensive ways to get reductions. I like that. Yeah. Uh, what is missing from this analysis uh, is we had no traction on the degree to which this is causing generic learning in the production of solar panels or the installation of solar panels or the operation of electricity systems uh, that uh, have renewables. And to the extent that that is producing generic learning, that would all uh, lend itself to uh, producing more favorable. All right, two more clips. Lower emissions. What are you trying to do? I've always felt that for 
an RPS. An R now these are the people that are sitting off to the side. Yeah. The guy on the far right was the one doing the presenting. And it's just some interesting takeaways. These people are all for carbon tax. I think that's their main push. RES, a CES, whatever you want to, sets of initials you want to do, uh, approach it by. There's a foundational question that seldom gets asked, and that is, what are you trying to do? And I know that sounds really simple and simplistic, but in dealings with it in, in the Senate and dealings with it on the Hill, you know, we, you'd ask the question, what are you trying to do? Is your driver climate? Are you trying to stop emissions? If you're trying to stop emissions, then clearly you need to have a wider net, include hydro, include nuclear. Yes. Fierce resistance to that generally from the RES uh, proponents. Um, they'll say, no, no, this is to drive technology for solar, for selected technologies. And selected technologies. Yeah, what does that mean? That's okay, but I think it's important to be upfront about what your purpose is. Which yeah, be is honest. Way too often. Uh, Michael, you and others who worked on this are sort of gunning for a carbon tax Last if you want to dump on renewable mandates. Um, can you respond to this criticism that you're trying to push an agenda? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, the agenda is that we should find, we need to be, look, the climate problem is real and urgent, and we need to be ruthlessly searching out the cheapest uh, reductions. So that's my agenda. Uh, and had it turned out that renewable portfolio standards were better than everything else, hooray. Uh, you know, I have no stake in what the answer is. Uh, and. It's a thing that it's in my, I actually don't have a Twitter account, so people read me these Twitters. Uh, <laughs> Why aren't you on Twitter, Michael? Because uh, I second write papers. <laughs> <laughs> Call back to the uh, thing in the video. And, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I think sometimes I think there's confusion about what the goal is. I think, you know, the enemy here is CO2. The enemy <laughs> is not like that there's not enough of a particular technology in the generation system. Like, that's not causing climate change. What's causing climate change is CO2. And, Somehow that's being lost, and at least on Twitter. That, that's my foundation. Being lost big time. Sorry, yeah. that was a little long, but it was a 50-page <laughs> paper, and it's very technical. Yeah. And it's being scrutinized right now. In summary, it's uh, pretty expensive, these solar technologies. Yes, these renewables. A lot of them. Yeah. So I think we have a TEDx we could jump into if you want to jump into that. If you have something else you want to talk about in the paper or... Let's jump into the TEDx talk. All right, TEDx, Why Renewables Can't Save the Planet. Time Magazine's Hero of the Environment and energy expert Michael Schallenberg. Our efforts really paid off in 2007 when then presidential candidate... And he's going into how he's been an activist and trying to get environmental stuff yeah. going. He's, now he's talking about what our efforts did and we, were, you know, we got, some, got some stuff going. That Barack Obama embraced our vision and between 2009 and 2015, the U.S. invested $150 billion in renewables and other kinds of clean tech. But right away, we started to encounter some problems. So first of all, the electricity from solar rooftops ends up costing about twice as much as the electricity from solar farms. And both solar farms and wind farms require covering a pretty significant amount of land with solar panels and wind turbines and also building very big transmission lines to bring all that electricity from the countryside into the city. Both of those things were often very strongly resisted by local communities, as well as by conservation biologists who were concerned about the impacts on wild bird species and other animals. Now, there was a lot of other people working on technical solutions at the time. One of the big challenges, of course, is just the intermittency of solar and wind. They only generate electricity about 10 to 30 percent of the time during most of the year. But some 10 to 30 percent of the time during most of the year. It's it's hard to find exact stats because yeah, it's super variable about yeah. where and then where it's placed and where it's facing. Yeah. Some but. of the solutions that were being proposed were to convert hydroelectric dams into gigantic batteries. The idea was that when the sun was shining and the wind was blowing, you would pump the water uphill, store it for later, and then when you needed electricity, run it over the turbines. Um, in terms of wildlife, some of these problems just didn't seem like a significant concern. So when I learned that house cats kill billions of birds every year, it put into perspective the hundreds of thousands of birds, rather, that, that are killed by wind turbines. Well, oh, that's cool. You know, house cats kill birds. It's all good. Let's yeah. moving on. Moving on. Birds are cool. Basically, seemed to me at the time that 
most if not all of the problems of scaling up solar and wind could be solved through more technological innovation. Now, I've made the bird argument to people, and they say it's no big deal. TEDx, back to the birds. Um, and it, it turns out that when it comes to birds and cats, uh, cats don't kill eagles. <laughs> eagles kill cats. What cats kill are the small, common sparrows and jays and robins, birds that are not endangered and not at risk of going extinct. What, what, what do kill eagles and other big birds like this kite, as well as owls and condors and other threatened and endangered species are wind turbines. In fact, they're one of the most significant threats to those big bird species that we have. We just haven't been introducing the airspace with many other objects like we have wind turbines over the last several years. And in terms of solar, you know, building a solar farm is a lot like building any other kind of farm. You have to clear the whole area of wildlife. So this is a picture of one third of uh, one of the biggest solar farms in California called Ivanpah. Ivanpah, if you're listening to the audio, go check that out. Ivanpah yeah, Solar it's Farm, it's crazy. gigantic. Dude. In order to build this, they had to clear the whole area of desert tortoises, literally pulling desert tortoises and their babies out of burrows, putting them on the back of pickup trucks and transporting them to captivity, where many of them ended up dying. And currently, the current estimates are that about 6,000 birds are killed every year, actually catching on fire above the solar farm and, and plunging to their death. That Dang. was crazy. Catching on fire? Did we have a report on that later. Oh, I was going to say, you I want to cut to it now, now or later? Yeah, we can go now. Yeah, because so some people were trying to say that it was bull. The company behind this $2.2 billion solar project. It's now under fire because the heat it produces, up to 900 degrees, is charring the feathers of birds flying through, often causing them to crash and die. Workers on site call them streamers because of the smoke plume created when the birds ignite in midair. In a report on avian mortality at three Southern California facilities, federal investigators found that these solar farms may act as a mega trap, attracting insects which in turn attract insect eating birds, which are then incapacitated. More than 500 birds have died at one plant and 1,000 more are expected to die every year at another. They found mortalities at all three solar technologies and they found a wide range of bird species being killed. Ooh. Birds often have a hard time navigating traditional barriers such as airplanes and windows. Wind farms kill more than 100,000 birds each year, but solar farms are a new obstacle. One solar company spent $22 million to protect and relocate. This is what the TEDx guy was just talking about, yeah. the tortoises locate hundreds of rare desert tortoises and is now worried about the later. birds. Other solar fields are planned for the California desert, including one near Joshua Tree National Park, which is on a well-known flight path no. for migrating birds, eagles, and falcons. So right now there is no solution, but these solar plants plan to experiment with everything from light, sound, and even drones to try to scare the birds away so they can keep on flying. 900 Jeez. degrees. 900 degrees. Wow. All right, Ben, thank you. Well, there you go. Solar farms killing birds. Yeah. Back to TEDx. Electricity prices are going up. All of the major problems with renewables aren't technical. They're natural. Well, dealing with all of this unreliability and the big environmental impacts obviously comes at a pretty high economic cost. You know, we've been hearing a lot about how solar panels and wind turbines have come down in cost in recent years, but that cost has been significantly outweighed by just the challenges of integrating all of that unreliable power onto the grid. Just take, for instance, what's happened in California. At the period in which solar panels have come down in price very significantly, same with wind, we've seen our electricity prices go up. Wow. And that was also in the other report. Five times more than the rest of the country. And it, it's not unique to us. You can see the same phenomenon happened in Germany, which is really the world's leader in solar wind and other renewable technologies. Their prices increased 50% during their big renewable energy push. Now, you might think, well, dealing with climate change is just going to require that we all pay more for energy. There you go. I've heard that argument. Yeah. That's what I used to think. But consider the case of France. France actually gets twice as much of its electricity from clean zero emission sources than does Germany. And yet 
France pays half as much, almost half as much for its electricity. How can that be? How can that be? I have no idea. What is France doing? Are they using wizardry, some kind of magic? I don't, I don't know what they're doing. France gets most of its electricity from nuclear power. Oh. Uh, okay. And how come no one talks about nuclear power? In the United States, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. About 75% in total. And nuclear just ends up being a lot more reliable, generating power 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for about 90% of the year. We see this phenomenon show up at a global level. So, for example, there's been a natural experiment over the last 40 years, even more than that, in terms of the deployment of nuclear and the deployment of solar. You can see that at a little bit higher cost, we got about half <laughs> as much electricity from solar and wind. So the blue yeah. on that chart is nuclear. <laughs> Everything. And, and people always argue that nuclear is very expensive. No, yeah. so is solar. Yeah, every, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then we did from nuclear. Well, what does all this mean for going forward? I think one of the most significant findings to date is this one. Had Germany spent $580 billion on nuclear instead of renewables, it would already be getting 100% of its, of its electricity from clean energy sources and all of its transportation energy. Awkward. Wow. That's awkward. But I know. Is, is nuclear power safe? That's what this guy's going to address next. He's got all the bases covered. He's good. Is nuclear power safe? And what do you do with the waste? Well, those are very reasonable questions. Turns out that there's been scientific studies on this going over 40 years. <laughs> this is just the most recent study. study that was done by the prestigious British medical journal Lancet. Finds that nuclear power is the safest. It's easy to understand why. According to the World Health Organization, about 7 million people die annually from air pollution. And nuclear plants don't emit that. As a result, the climate scientist James Hansen looked at it, and he calculated that nuclear power has already saved almost 2 million lives to date. Oil spills in the ocean. Oh, yeah, tons of people Yeah, have died over fossil fuels. Yeah. It turns out that even wind energy is more deadly than nuclear. This is a, a <laughs> photograph taken of two maintenance workers in the Netherlands shortly before one of them fell to his death to avoid the fire and the other one was engulfed in flames. Now, what about environmental impact? Well, I think a really easy way to think about it is that uranium fuel, which is what we use to power nuclear plants, is just really energy dense. About, as mount, about the same amount of uranium as this, as this Rubik's Cube can power all of the energy that you need in your entire life. As a consequence, you just don't need that much land in order to produce a significant amount of electricity. Here you can compare the solar farm I just described, Ivanpah, to California's last nuclear plant, Diablo Canyon. It takes 450 times more land to generate the same amount of electricity as it does from nuclear. You would need 17 more solar farms like Ivanpah in order to generate the same output Damn. as Diablo Canyon. And of course, it would then be unreliable. What about yeah. mining? But, well, this has been studied pretty closely as well, and it just turns out that solar panels require 17 times more materials than nuclear plants do in the yeah. form of cement, glass, concrete, steel, and that includes all the fuel used for those nuclear plants. The consequence is that what comes out at the end, since it's material throughput, is just not a lot of waste from nuclear. All of the waste from the Swiss nuclear program fits into this room. Nuclear waste is actually the only waste from electricity production that's safely contained and internalized. Every other way of making electricity emits the waste into the natural environment, either as pollution or as material waste. We tend to think of solar panels as clean, but the truth is, is that there is no plan to deal with solar panels at the end of their 20 or 25 year life. A lot of experts are actually very concerned that solar panels are just going to be shipped to poor countries in Africa or Asia. What else are we going to do with them? Yeah. With the rest of our electronic waste stream to be disassembled, often exposing people to really high levels of toxic, of toxic elements, including lead, cadmium, and chromium, elements yeah. that, because they're elements, their toxicity never declines over time. Wow. So a couple things. I wanted to show this okay. graph. So these are obviously just estimates because mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to know exactly how much, you know, every panel is going to output. And again, it depends on location. I've heard some people say that the sun has to be 
really directly shiny. Yeah. They are developing newer technologies, and I think in lab they've gotten up to 46% efficiency, but most of the ones we currently see are only 15 to 20% efficient. And so they estimated that you would need 21,000 square miles of solar panels to power the entire United United States. States for a year. Which they made it sound like it wasn't that much, but look at how much that yeah, is. Yeah, quite that's, a large chunk there. Yeah. And and to put things kind of in perspective, environmentalists were very concerned about Trump's border wall or mm. his proposed border the wall. environmental impact. But that's only a thousand uh, square miles long. Mm -hmm. And if you multiply that, assuming it's a mile wide, which is Pre that's a huge very wall. wide. It's a huge, so huge wall. You're looking at 20 Trump balls. Yeah. It, so where's you, the environmental impact? Yeah. Just, and, and he mentioned the, I mean, this is going to displace mm -hmm. all the wildlife. Yeah. I mean, that's a crazy amount of land. Okay. How about Trump's wall? It's just solar panels. And since well, they're frying birds. Yeah. Just fry. <laughs> fry anybody trying to cross the border. <laughs> you know, it's, well, what, it's we, need, we need more though. It's yeah. not enough. Yeah, a but lot. that's also really concerning. Yep. Uh, though about the waste, which people don't talk about, is what's going to happen yes. to these solar panels. Well, what happens to all of our waste now? Especially well, our e-waste, and it all goes to China. <laughs> it, it well, countries. if they're still accepting so it, it not... goes to China because they don't have regulations over there, so they take the plastic, they burn it, and then they yeah. drip acid. And... and it goes back into the environment. <laughs> yes, it goes straight to their food so, crops. We don't see it, but yeah. it's still hurting the planet. Which is why we should probably invest in ways to recycle. But And actually, this leads us into the next TEDx clip. Are we destroying the environment to save the climate? In the effort to try to save the climate, are we destroying the environment? Well, the interesting thing is that over the last several hundred years, human beings have actually been trying to move away from what you would consider matter-dense fuels towards energy-dense ones. And that means really from wood and dung towards coal, oil, natural gas, uranium. This is a phenomenon that's been going on for a long time. Poor countries around the world are in the process still of moving away from wood and dung as their primary energies. And for the most part, this is a positive thing. Uh, as you stop using wood as your major source of fuel, it allows the forests to grow back and the wildlife to return. As you stop burning wood in your home, you, don't, you no longer need to breathe that toxic smoke. And as you go from coal to natural gas and uranium as your main sources of energy, it holds out the possibility of basically eliminating air pollution altogether. There's just this problem with nuclear. While it's been pretty popular to move from dirtier to cleaner energy sources, from energy diffuse to energy dense sources, nuclear is just really unpopular for a bunch of historical reasons. And as a consequence, in the past, I and I think a lot of others have sort of said, well, in order to deal with climate change, we're just going to need all the different kinds of clean energy that we have. The problem is, is that just turns out not to be true. You remember I discussed France a little bit ago. France gets most of its electricity from nuclear. If France were to try to significantly scale up solar and wind, it would also have to significantly reduce how much electricity it gets from nuclear. That's because in order to handle the huge variability of solar and wind on the grid, they would need to burn more natural gas. Think of it this way, it's just really hard to ramp up and down a nuclear plant, whereas I think we're all pretty familiar with turning the natural gas up and down on our stove. A similar process works in managing the grid. Of course, it goes without saying that oil and gas companies understand this pretty well, which is why we've seen them invest millions of dollars. Yes. Very interesting. The natural gas companies love green energy. They love it. They love this stuff. Oh, man. Yeah, they're committed. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> recent years in promoting solar and wind. This just raises, I think, another challenging question, which is that in places that are using a lot of nuclear, have grids that are mostly uh, nuclear and hydro, going towards solar and wind and other renewables would actually increase carbon emissions. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Rounding them off, scientists telling the truth. A better alternative is just to tell the truth, and that's what a number of scientists have been doing. I mentioned earlier that hundreds of thousands of birds are killed every year by wind turbines. What I didn't mention is that a million bats, at a minimum, are killed every year by wind. The consequence has been that bat scientists have been speaking out about this. This particular bat species, the hoary bat, 
which is a my the hoary bat. You Aww. gotta look at it. It's so cute. Migratory bat species is literally at risk of going extinct right now because of the significant expansion of wind. It's not just wind, it's also on solar. The scientists who were involved in creating the Ivanpah solar farm, who were involved in clearing that land, have been speaking out. One of them wrote, everybody knows that translocation of desert tortoises doesn't work. When you're walking in front of a bulldozer crying and moving animals and cacti out of the way, it's hard to think that the project is a good idea. Ooh. And now we can see these phenomena at work at, a, at an international level. In my home state of California, we've been stuffing a lot of natural gas into the side of a mountain in order to handle all that intermittent solar and wind. It sprung a leak. Porter Ranch, I believe. You guys want to Google that? It was the equivalent to putting 500,000 cars on the road. And currently in Germany, there's protesters trying to block a new coal mining project uh, that would involve destroying the ancient Hombach forest in order to get to the coal underneath, all in an effort to phase out nuclear and expand solar and wind. Crazy. Okay, so we're anti-nuclear. Yeah. Should we play the smart guy saying that he's for nuclear, the one that everyone loves? Here's a smart guy. Let's, let's do it. Stanford Precourt Institute for Energy, Energy Investments Dialogue. We'll all recognize this man. So switching subject, you are a big supporter of nuclear. And in fact, you've invested in Terra Power. And my question to you is that right now, it is not cost competitive in the United States. Korea has done very well in this. And Terra Power is going to install, I think, the first thing in China. And so... What are your thoughts on how to make nuclear, which is a carbon, as you said, base load power, how do you make it competitive today? This is Bill Gates responding, investing in nuclear. Yeah, so nuclear starts out per reaction with a million times advantage over burning hydrocarbons. So you'd think, hey, a factor of a million, uh, that, you know, we must be able to preserve at least some of that and not be absurdly uh, expensive. In fact, in the U.S., uh, it, nuclear is not even close to being competitive. It's probably a factor of four or five non-competitive. The key parameters in a nuclear build are how long it takes to build, what your interest rate of your money is, uh, and maybe some uncertainty factor of whether you get stopped or not. Uh, and so in China, those numbers are basically three to four years and 2%. 2%, three to four years. Whereas in the U.S., there may be eight to nine years, 15%. Eight, eight to nine years, 15%? Yeah. What the hell? There's way too much regulation and fear here. Yep. Maybe 50% chance you'll get shut down before you get started. So when you're competing with super cheap natural gas, it, there's no way. Also, Interesting how they just leave it there for that. Yeah. He, it's a longer clip, but... But then uh, solar gets subsidized. Yeah, solar subsidized. And everyone wants yeah. to spend all this money on solar. On solar. But and why? people want to argue. And I just, yeah. my whole point is why are we wasting time? Is it because we've spent all this money in this bullcrap technology that now we have to just support it? We can't yeah. admit that nuclear is the way to go? I, and, I mean, to me, it just seems like basic math here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about energy density. Mm -hmm. Nuclear energy is way more dense. I think you need maybe 400 nuclear power plants to power the U.S. To power the entire U.S. Yeah, and, and that's actually probably a high estimate because yeah. currently nuclear plants do not run at 100% capacity, but they easily could. Mm -hmm. And then there's they're also uh, making these nuclear power plants more efficient. So many of our power plants in the U.S. are very old. If we upgrade them, they'll be more efficient. They're looking at new energy sources like thorium. That was mm. another argument. Oh, we don't have enough uranium. But they they really doing well, good work. I'm going to say Chernobyl and Fukushima. Yeah, that's the argument everyone makes. That Oh, no. Look at Fukushima. Look at Chernobyl. Well, so many people died. PBS NewsHour, the impact of Chernobyl, Chernobyl's nuclear disaster 33 years later. This is almost 33 years ago, and here you are putting out a book now. What, what's untold about it? Uh, well, I would say that the, the principal aspect of what's untold about it is that this version of the story is true. <laughs> um, what did we get wrong? Well, because the Soviet government did 
such an excellent job of attempting to cover up the truth at the beginning. Mm. You know, most people's conceptions of what happened uh, are kind of rooted in the initial um, propaganda that the Soviet Union put out, and also um, the misinformation that resulted from a lack of information. So, mm. for example, you know, a lot of people still think that tens of thousands of people died almost immediately as a result of this accident. That's not the case. That's not the case. And, and but part of the reason. What? What? <laughs> I heard it was the case. I was yeah. always taught it was a huge, big disaster, meltdown. Oh. Thousands of people died. Students, they, they all tell me that as well, that they're scared of nuclear. Moving on, carrying on. For that is, is Western correspondents in Moscow weren't allowed access to any information. So they did their best with kind of rumors and hearsay with the result that I think within a week of the accident, the New York Post was reporting that 15,000 people had died and their bodies buried in a nuclear waste dump somewhere in Ukraine. Wow. Gee. Okay. And when in fact it was what? When how much, how many people? How many people? In fact, the death toll from the accident by that point was two. <laughs> two. One man died in the initial explosion. A second um, man died by dawn that day as a result of burns he sustained in the explosion. And then how do we calculate the ones who sort of got horrible cancers? I mean, the official figures are that within five months, another 29 people had died as a result of, as a result of radiation exposure they received mm -hmm. in those few hours after the first explosion. But then when you start to try and attribute cancers directly to the results of the accident, things get a lot trickier because of the complexities of epidemiology, but also because of the extent of the attempts at a cover-up by the Soviet government. Very interesting. Yeah. And this is a quick comment on technology. I like it. Kind of agree with it. A book that's necessarily against nuclear technology or for, it seems to be more about how we collectively put so much faith in technology. I think that's right. Um, I mean, I've, I've tried to, to show the facts of what happened rather than you know, including any polemic that's either pro or anti-nuclear energy. Um, I think the wider lesson of, of the story is, is one of overconfidence in technology, um, which I think is really, you know, is obviously still with us today. Yeah, besides Facebook, we're talking about big data that we're not as conscious of, artificial intelligence. Exactly. That is and we're assuming it's, it's always improving our lives, mm -hmm. rather than perhaps you mm -hmm. know, controlling and altering the way things happen. Right, Adam. I, that was That's, pretty interesting. Yeah, interesting little commentary there. Uh, I wanted to mention too, though, how, you know, even people, again, they're still so afraid of it, but there's, there was already such a low risk. Mm -hmm. And we see that, you know, maybe Chernobyl was kind of overblown. Well, even our world in data, Fukushima, 40 to 50 people experienced physical injury or radiation burns at the nuclear facility. Number of direct deaths from the incident are quoted to be zero. However, mortality from radiation exposure was not the only threat to human health. It is estimated around 1,600 people died as a result of evacuation procedures and stress-induced factors. This figure ranges between 1,000 to 1,600 deaths from evacuation. The evacuation of populations affected by earthquakes and tsunami at the time can make sole attribution to nuclear disaster challenging. Stress included deaths. St Stress-induced deaths affected mostly older people. More than 90% of mortality included individuals over the age of 66. Again, not really related some nuclear, to nuclear, yeah. an A bomb going off and wiping no. everybody out. That's not yeah. the way it works. And I was going to say, though, that they have backup systems for backup systems. Yes. There's so much redundancy, and the automatic response is always to shut down. So you need to have input to make your nuclear reactor go. So Continue. these are really yeah. safe. <laughs> well, theoretically. Yeah. And more efficient. Efficiency well, is key not, here. Not just theoretically. They've been oh. proven to be... I mean, yeah, just... They I can know. think of how many people die from oil. I, Look at I all the know. birds I, that I, die. I've been making this argument for so long, it <laughs> drags on me. And it, it just... Yeah. I can't keep but doing it. Everyone's all about the Green New Deal. Yeah. Even LA, they have their own Green New no. Deal. It, it just doesn't make sense. It's It doesn't seem like the solution if you look no, at the map. It just seems like they're investing money yeah. into bull crap ideas instead of actually f fixing things and again yep. natural gas those guys are the big players in this green this green crap and they're big pushers they're all yeah. on board because you need they you need their you need the gas guys in order to power and and they're the all green. milking these government initiatives 
for green technology. But... Yes, solar heavily government subsidized <laughs> I, Tesla as well. I would argue that the environmental impacts of solar are way worse and wind. Yeah, are way worse than nuclear. Than nuclear. I think we should argue that. Maybe That's next it. time. Rounding off today's episode, I like to talk about education for a minute, only because. Our local university had a crazy rave party for their students and posted it on Instagram. Is this how you attract students? I don't understand. What's the point of this? Uh, Shouldn't you want to attract students who want to learn? Has the school ever done anything at this scale for a science-related event? No. Aren't colleges about learning, not partying? Uh, uh, Aren't people going to say you're a party pooper, Robert? Well, it's, again, (laughs) schools are about learning, not partying. And I'm cool with, you know, students throwing parties at the dorms, learning management skills, social skills, these things. You, that's cool. But this is a university-sponsored party, and they're just yeah. doing it to get higher enrollment, increase the enrollment. That's but why? True. Do you, you want students that want to party all the time, or do you want students that want to learn? <laughs> why are coaches paid so much more than professors, too? That's true. It, it doesn't seem like we value education. Substantially much more. It just bothers me. Ask at HealthyTalkShow.com. We'll we'll continue this conversation there. (laughs) Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. Reach out to us. Ask at HealthyTalkShow.com, Instagram, and Twitter. Healthy Talk Show, drop the W. Leave us a voicemail, 509-878-3229. And HealthyTalkShow.com slash Discord. Love and light. Love and light. Thank you so much for watching. For more Healthy Talk Show, please consider subscribing to our podcast over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash subscribe. It's free. Twitter and Instagram, at Healthy Talk Show, drop the W. We record the podcast live Mondays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash live. Love and light.